Profiles in Cinemania, Tony Scott. The northeast of England is a cold and harsh part of the world. This is where iron men would build great steel ships that passed down the time into the oceans of the world. Factories dominated the horizon, and the steel cables of cranes groaned under load day and night. Slate grey skies, rain and cold are your friends here. It's a place of pies and brown ale, an area of hard work and steady lives. A territory of football songs and nights down the pub. In short, it's about as far as you can get from the danger zone. Tony Scott came up in the northeast, and along with his brother Ridley, very quickly decided that life up north wasn't for him. They both went to film school in London and had big ambitions. It was Ridley who got his chance first, forming a film company to make commercials in the 1970s. This was the golden age of the TV advert, where few channels and no skip button meant that the adverts had a captive audience and a good TV advertisement could make or break a brand instantly. Success in this world meant crafting an impact instantly, and the directors who could do it became very much in demand indeed. After finishing at the Royal College of Art, Tony Scott originally wanted to be a painter, but it was Ridley who told him, come join me in directing commercials, you'll have a Ferrari within a year. And he was right. It turns out, Tony was a natural. He had a genius for smashing the audience with immediate impact and crafting a strong impression in moments. As the 80s dawned, many of the directors who had turned British TV advertisements into the envy of the world began drifting into Hollywood, looking for bigger challenges and bigger paychecks. His first big feature was The Hunger, with Catherine Deneuve and David Bowie, and he is responsible for introducing the world to Willem Dafoe, so hold that against him if you must. The film wasn't a huge commercial success, but it had buckets of style, and proved that the younger Scott could hold his own, and bring a unique sensibility to the screen for a new and flashy decade. Tony had directed an ad for the car maker Saab, in which one of their cars is seen racing alongside one of their jets, which they also built. By happenstance, Jerry Bruckheimer had been looking for a director to helm his upcoming project about fighter jets and the fighting fighters who fight in them, and according to later accounts by Scott, his advert for Saab was about the only footage of fighter jets floating around. So he ended up landing a directing gig on a little-known project called Top Gun. As soon as he made The Sky His Limit, the sky continued to remain being the limit, if you see what I mean. Tony Scott had found his niche. He could craft a big, flashy 1980s action movie on time and on budget, and suddenly he was in demand. Beverly Hills Cop 2 followed and was an enormous success. The 80s were here and the money was rolling in. While Ridley Scott focused on exploring futuristic themes in films like Alien and Blade Runner, Tony was the spirit of the now, and the now demanded electric guitars, Tom Cruise, and movies that were pitched in an elevator halfway up Cocaine Mountain. As the 90s rolled in, Tony began to get a bit more thoughtful, sort of. He still put out the Tom Cruise racing spectacle Days of Thunder, but he also helped up-and-comer Quentin Tarantino break into the scene by directing True Romance pressure cooker examination of responsibility and command in the superior submarine splashy spectacular Crimson Tide, and also directed Schwarzenegger in the bizarre anti-action movie deconstruction Last Action Hero, which was a glorious satire, and if you don't think so, you're wrong. His biggest hit of the decade came in the Will Smith and Gene Hackman conspiracy thriller Enemy of the State. From mindless spectacle, his films were becoming really quite mindful spectacle. If the 90s had seen Scott questioning his 80s certainty, in the 2000s he almost became more relaxed, trying out different styles with action thrillers Domino, Man on Fire, and The Taking of Pelham 123, all rather straightforward affairs which seemed almost rote at this point rather than pushing really new barriers. His work came at a frenetic pace, and over a relatively short career he put out 17 feature films, not to mention work on music videos and TV, and the whole time he never lost that Tony Scott touch. Fast cuts, fancy style, and experimental camera work. However, sadly, all was not well with him. In 2012, he took his own life, jumping from the Vincent Thomas Bridge in Los Angeles. Although reports at the time were mixed and unclear, Ridley Scott later commented that he had been battling a cancer diagnosis for some time, although there had been no indication in advance that he'd been planning anything like this. There rarely is. 
The brothers Scott made their own unique marks on the film landscape, and if Tony was taken from us too soon, that does nothing to diminish his legacy. He showed Hollywood a whole new way to be, and his fingerprints are all over the way film entertainment is packaged and presented today. We would be living in a slower and more sedate world without him. Next time you're blown away by a ludicrous series of explosions, just remember where it all started, back in England. If you can go from Sunderland to Hollywood, the stars no longer seem quite so far away. This has been another Profile in Cinemania. This episode was written and performed by Andy Slack. Music by Meteor at meteormusic.bandcamp.com and Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Symphony No. 9, From the New World in E Minor, Largo, provided courtesy of Wikimedia Commons. Profiles in Cinemania is a production of the Cinemania Society, LLC.